All right, can you hear me now? Hello? Can you see me and hear me now? Hello. <laughs> All right. Can somebody Can somebody tell me if you can hear me and you can see me? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, this is very dumb. Yes, so I forgot to press the button. <laughs> Have I been talking to myself for 10 minutes? <laughs> I've been talking to myself for 10 minutes in here alone. <laughs> this is terrible. So you couldn't hear me before. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so dumb. <laughs> you see, this is what this is what caffeine does to me. I had I'm having a coffee. I just put like a tiny bit, like um, like half a teaspoon on this thing today. <laughs> I've been talking to myself for 10 minutes alone without, because I didn't press the button. Oh my God, this is so dumb. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah, totally. Uh, this was, yeah, I was, I was like, why is nobody saying hi? <laughs> Don't they love me anymore? <laughs> Did I do something to them? The workshop didn't go well. <laughs> okay, so let, let me breathe into this. All right. <sighs> okay, we have the camp is, is working. We have campers. Uh, people are fine. <laughs> Whoa, so many familiar faces. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, where was I? Where was I? Um, where was I? Yes, I was saying, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you're calling from. <laughs> if you, if you want to say hi on the chat and who you are, where you're coming from, etc., etc. Um, although I see a lot of familiar faces already, I like, I love seeing, uh, I love seeing, uh, I love seeing people and people that I know and. Um, and that I'm not talking to myself like I was 10 minutes ago, <laughs> that I'm actually talking to people. Uh, so, okay, so that's great. Um, I was saying, what was I saying? I was saying there were a few comments before on the, um, on the machine learning workshops that I was teaching, that I was co-teaching last, last weekend. Uh, for those of you who may, who may miss I may have missed the live stream two weeks ago or are not on the Discord or didn't register or whatever. Like um, my friends Nono, Nate and I taught a seminar on machine learning for architecture like um, two weeks ago. Sorry, last weekend on Saturday. It was a full Saturday of like lectures and demos and um, it was a lot of work. I was exhausted. I've been so tired uh, this week, like recovering, but I think we're fine now. And um, it was very interesting because um, we basically spent um, the whole day just like giving, I was perhaps like more on the theory and historical background of machine learning. Nono and Nate made more of like practical demos and they actually put together some um, they actually put together some new models that they publish on Runway and that are now accessible and some demos that you can check online. We had some guest, guest talks from Elizabeth Cristoforetti from Supernormal. We had talks from, um, from some of my students, um, uh, Runja and Al, who, were, who did like a very cool project on like graph, like breaking down a graph structure from a floor plan and using machine learning to predict the actual shape of that floor plan based on a graph representation of the connections. Um, we had Andrew Witt, who is a professor here at Harvard University at the School of Design, 
uh, who was talking about a lot of the machine vision work that he's been doing um, with machine learning. And, and we had my favorite moment, which was this one. <laughs> like we had like a one hour full Q&A questions, participation, conversation with everybody. And I'm actually, I'm actually really happy to, because I, I met, I finally, I saw the face of many people that I've been seeing here in the chat uh, for a long time. I think I met Arasto, who was there. I met Salvador, who's also here in the chat, I believe, today. Uh, Indrajit, I've seen him very often as well here. Uh, and many other people that I'm, of, of course, I'm totally forgetting. Emmanuel, I've also seen him around uh, here in the chat very often. Um, so it was great. Rafael, yeah, Rafael is here and he's also on the chat. Uh, say hi, Rafael. Uh, and um, I don't know. It was a great experience. I was very happy about it. I think um, I think it was a useful thing for a lot of people. And uh, so we're happy. I'm very happy that we made this happen. It was a lot of effort, but um, but um, Monique, you were not on the photo. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it was great. Um, I don't know. I'm very happy about it. I'm super tired. Um, I don't know if I would do it again anytime soon, but um, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of people have asked for the video recordings. We have issues with copyrighted material and some work that has not been published yet that we presented on 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 this seminar. So for the time being, we've made the precautionary decision of not publishing those recordings, unfortunately. Um, and if we change that decision, um, you will hear from us on social media and I will definitely broadcast things on the Discord channel and I will post links to it, etc, etc. Which, by the way, uh, let me post a link to the Discord channel again, just in, in case anybody wants to join. Um, and um, so, yeah, so that was great. And I'm very tired today, which is unfortunate because we have a lot of stuff to go. I want to do a lot of stuff today. So, and I'm not sure it's going to happen as usual. Uh, we'll see. Um, now, where do I want to go with this today? Um, where do I want to go? So there's a couple of things I want to do. I want to say, so I want to give a couple of shout outs. Um, so somebody on the chat pointed me to, pointed everybody to this new list, this new YouTube channel, which is called, is by Philip Kinderman. And I think he is some kind of professor at a German university. Uh, but he has all these really, really cool lectures on computational geometry. Um, I think they are pretty technical and they're very high level. I don't think he gets into writing code much in these ones, but he has a very nice way of breaking down the algorithms and explaining at a high level how you would implement like a, like a point sweeping, like a, like a point containment, like all those kind of um, algorithms. So, so this is, Hey, hey, Monique, would you mind? That's a very good point you made. Would you mind sharing a link to that, to that website, that to that page that Nono made with um, with the resource, resources for the talk? Thank you for that. Um, so somebody pointed me to this YouTube channel. Um, I think it's really good if you're interested in computational geometry. I recommend you check it out. It's very high level, um, but I think I'm actually very excited about the possibility of like using some of those videos as support material and then actually building together some of the algorithms that Philip is pointing out that he, he that he does a really good job at explaining conceptually. So it could be like a nice compliment, like like a geometry gem where I implement the algorithm, but I point to like, if you want to learn more conceptually, go check out this video by Philip. I think this is, um, this could be like a really, a really good thing. I also want to give a couple shout outs to um, 
two YouTube channels that are also doing a lot and creating a lot of content on computational design. So they're both in, in Portuguese because they're both from Brazil. This is from Emmanuel Dering. Uh, it's called Arquitetura Paramétrica and he has like a lot of videos also on like replicating um, well-known buildings or like doing like basic tutorials on Grasshopper. So I like these videos are very similar to what we do here with the algorithmic modeling challenges. He also has some special special ones on plugins like Grasshopper, etc. So I think I think it's really good if you speak Portuguese. You should definitely check this out. Uh, and Emmanuel, I've also seen him uh, very often here in the chat, and he was also on the um, on the um, on the machine learning seminar the other day. And very similarly, Leonardo Grindi has this other YouTube channel, also in Portuguese, um, Fala Parametricos, like Speak Parametric. <laughs> uh, and he has like a lot of very interesting videos as well, also combining basic tutorials, some interviews, some modeling challenges. Um, so this is also pretty interesting. He's also from Porto Alegre, which I happen to have a lot of friends there and a lot of like wonderful ties to university and people who live there. So. Um, that's kind of nice uh, at a personal level, uh, but that's, that's, I mean, you guys don't really care about that. That's fine. Uh, and, um, but yeah, and the nice thing is that I, I did find out about this by, because of they introduced themselves here in the Discord channel and they pointed to their YouTube streams. So, um, I'm very happy that the Discord channel, the Discord server is starting to get more traction and more people are uh, participating and we're engaging in conversation. So I think this is great. Uh, so if you are interested in also like being up to being part of that conversation and like what's going on, I'm going to post the link again here to the Discord channel. Uh, am I? Where is that link? Yes, it's here. So if you want to join, um, just feel free to go here. Uh, we have an introduction channel. So when you land, make sure that you come to introductions and we have a template kind of So all the way at the top. We have a template about how to introduce yourself, your hobbies, etc, etc. So if you want to use this template, it would be nice. Um, and it helps me understand who are part of the community, um, what's interesting for you, uh, where you're coming from, and, and it helps me like think about content. And we also have conversations about topic suggestions, etc. That's where uh, somebody pointed to Philip Kinderman's um, channel. So um, I think this is really, I'm really enjoying the conversation that we're having on this card. Because you know, when you're, when I'm streaming, uh, I really can't pay much attention to the chat because I can focus on recording the videos. So it's, um, it's a little complicated. Uh, also remember, if you like this content, make sure to you subscribe to the channel and you turn on alerts. And maybe if you like the videos, you can also like them, etc. all those things, you know, all the things. <laughs> all right. And what are we doing today? Let me go to the channel. Where are we going? What are we doing today? We are going to, we're going to, oh, look, we are streaming right now. <laughs> so last stream, no, this is not what I'm looking for. This one on last stream, we made a point sorting algorithm where we took a cloud of points and we sorted them by either X, X location, Y location or Z location. Wait, wait, this is, look, look, this is me. Hello, Jose. Hello. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> tika, 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 tika. Your nose. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help doing these things. <laughs> so we made a, a point sorting algorithm, uh, both by distance, by proximity, and by X and Y. But I forgot, so I think, and but I didn't publish this because, um, I thought that by the end, we didn't really show examples of like what cool things can be done with um, this sorting algorithm. So I want to spend today like five or 10 minutes to uh, 
record like a small clip to add it to this video and to just show like cool examples of like, oh, if we take a mesh uh, and then we apply this algorithm, then it looks like uh, there's like a line, squiggly line, like going over the mesh and it's kind of interesting, etc. So I want to make like a couple like really quick examples to add to this video and then we will publish that next week. And then the other, so that's, a, that's going to be like a short thing. The other thing that I would like to do, this is the main thing that I would like to do for today, is I would like to implant, we're going to do a geometry gem. And the geometry gem we're going to do is going to be Chaikin's algorithm. And um, what is this? This is an algorithm for taking a polyline, okay, so like a list of vertices, and then creating a smooth curve that uses the vertices of that polyline as control points. So if let's say we have a polyline like this one. Um, let me reload this page. Let's say we have a polyline like this one. Okay. And um, we start by performing recursive subdivisions, recording subdivisions, and at some point those subdivisions are so many that it looks like it's a smooth curve. Okay. This is called Chaikin's algorithm because it's an algorithm from the 70s, uh, back when computer graphics were at a super young age and um, coming up with efficient algorithms to generate smooth geometries on screens was actually a field of research. So what this was one of the first algorithms that tried to do that. Um, it, I'll tell a little bit about the story of this algorithm in, in a second. Uh, but the, the nice thing is that it's a very simple algorithm to implement. It's super easy to do. Uh, the result is very uh, visually appealing. Uh, so like you can create with very, very little effort, you can create um, polylines that look very smooth, like, like they have curvature. And also I'm doing this at a personal level. I'm doing this because very recently I met, uh, I met his son. I met Paul Chaikin, who's actually, this website is from his son and his website has a lot of like really interesting um, other um, um, small sketches with geometry and data visualization. So um, when I met him, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like I should do a, a piece on, on the channel on this algorithm, right? Especially because it's also like, it's very simple to, to, to implement. Um, and also the result of this geometry turns out that is an approximation of what's called quadratic B splines by um, piece uh, is blah, blah, blah. it's called it's an approximation of a piecewise quadratic B spline, which um, can be built with other algorithms. But this is from a computer graphics perspective is a really simple one to do. So we're going to do this. This is going to be the gem and I will explain the algorithm and I will explain how it works. But in order to build this gem, we will need to know how to do one other computational geometry operation, which is calculating the relative distance between two points. So generating a point at a relative distance between two points. That is a very simple thing to do. But since you know me already, I want to build a foundational repository of knowledge on all things um, computational design. So I'm just going to focus, I'm going to build that gem. And then once we have it, we're going to go on in doing just like we did, what was it for? We did the polyline simplification, curve simplification, we did the curve simplification, polyline simplification, we did the polyline simplification algorithm. And in order to do that, we needed the we needed to be able to calculate the distance from a line from a point to a line, the closest distance. So we did the two gems. So we're going to do something similar today. Okay. All right. Am I still in the stream? Can you still hear me? Um, and then after after that, we will do like a little bit of Q and A as usual. Uh, we will not have a stream in the afternoon. Hopefully, if I get all of this in by today. Um, so that's the plan for today. All right. Uh, OK. 
Okay. Okay, I see people. All right. Um, Monique is saying that she thought that the seminar was awesome, but a little overwhelming and intense. It was very intense <laughs> and it was a little overwhelming also for us, but uh, it was meant to be an, a general introduction. So, so if you like what you saw, perhaps now it's a good time to start trying to figure out how to learn the techniques to make this happen. Um, okay, so I'm going to, all right, I'm going to start closing things up and setting up. We're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to, um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to record the video, the addition where, to the previous video, to the previous live stream where I take that, where I take the algorithm whether we did last time and I imp I apply to like a bunch of randomly generated points on some known elements like a surface or I take a mesh, I take the points out of that mesh and then we use the algorithm to propagate the polyline over those points. I think that could be, those could be like two interesting applications of that. Um, so for that, I'm going to need Grasshopper, I'm going to need the files from last week. So that should be here and this is going to be, what is it today? The 3rd, July 3rd, 2020. You've just seen this from the future. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop this. This is taking. Okay, and then um, uh, what are we? Point sorting. There you go. Found it. So yeah. So for this one, we were just um, taking. Why oh, is this not working? Oh yeah, it is working. We're just not sure. Okay, so it's just disabled. All right. So if you remember from um, from last week or two weeks ago, we had all these random points here and we were sorting them by, for example, X, Y, or Z. So these are points sorted by C height and then joined with a polyline. And then these are points sorted by proximity. So whenever we have, whenever we check a point, we try to find the one in the rest of the point cloud that is closest to this one. But because this is a volume of points, it's actually kind of hard to see what's going on. So what I would like to do is I would like to generate like a couple of geometry objects. Like um, I'm thinking of like a cylinder. I'm thinking of like a surface. And I'm thinking of a mesh. Yes, so let's do that and then generate random points on those and then join those points with these algorithms. So, so yes, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to plug in here. I'm going to plug in here. Can, yes, I'm going to plug a relay. That I'm going to use to pipe those in. Um, so that's going to be, I'm going to save this as another. And then here, for example, let me say, and then I'm just going to record like a two minute thing where I show this working. Um, so for example, let's say we create a cylinder like that one. Um, and we have, there was like a random points on, on populate, populate generic geometry with points. Right, there was something like that. Yes, so let me turn this off and let me turn this off and this off. So yeah, so we have this and we have the amount of points. It's going to be here and uh, random seed, 
a pre-existing population, no pre-existing population. Um, and then if we do that, we have the cylinder. And if I plug this in here, I can see that the result is kind of cool, which is this distribution of points over sort of the surface is not really the surface of the cylinder, um, but kind of. And we also see the jumps whenever there is no, we see the start here and we, no, this is probably the end because it's coming from a lot of really, because you can see, this is very cool. You can see how the end here is coming from like a lot of jumps, continuous jumps, because at some point the algorithm runs out of like points in the proximity. So it has, it has to go to like the five or six points that were left untraced from the algorithm, um, which is kind of cool. And like, yes, like VVR is saying, like the, it looks like a growth kind of pattern on top of the surface. Um, we could do something where we say, if the line, we could also implement something where we say like, if the line, if the distance between the two points is over, is larger than a particular value, then just don't just break the polyline there and just create like different polylines, right? That could be done. Um, another thing that I would like to do, I would like to do the same thing on not a cylinder, but more of like a, like a napkin kind of surface. So let me draw that. So I'm going to draw something that looks a bit like a, not like a napkin kind of. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to move this around here. I'm going to lock this. I'm going to lock this into here. Yes. And then I'm going to take the surface and I'm going to bring it, set one surface here and I'm going to remove these guys here. I'm going to internalize. Do I want to internalize? Nah, it's fine. Cause then we can, we can tweak this thing. And then I probably want to do the same thing here. So I want to generate just a bunch of random points on top of the surface and generate this like this. Uh, and now you can see the same effect. It looks like a, like a, this sort of like growth pattern on top of the um, surface. If I do instead, if I show the Z one, this is a little crazy, but if I change this to, for example, X, we're going to see this kind of like nice hairy effect on the pad on the, which I find really cool, uh, somehow. <laughs> um, now I think the Z one is, is probably cooler for the cylinder. Yes, because it's sweeping the cylinder from, from below to the top. I'm going to internalize this data here. Uh, and I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to delete this thing so that I can just turn it on. Yeah. And, um, so that's for the surface. And then I'm going to download. Let's download this. Do you guys know the Stanford Bunny? Have you ever heard of it? Stan, Stanford Bunny. Yeah, then let's download this. The Stanford Scan Repository. Okay, that's very elaborate. Uh, file format. Is there an STL? No. Um, Where can we download the bunny? Does anybody have a good link to the bunny? Is this the one? Size 3,000, 35,000 vertices. Well, that's a lot, but eh, why not? So I'm going to download the bunny. Um, and we're going to put it somewhere here. And, um, <clears throat> Oh no, they should go 3DM. Mm, I like 3DM, but I like 3DM better for nerves geometry, but because this has to be a mesh, because what I want to do is I want to use the, the vertices of the, the Stanford bunny as the points that we're going to travel around. So I would rather use some other 
format that extract here the bunny and I have the bunny and it's the data of PLY. Uh, this is not your back read me. What is this? This is very confusing. Oh, okay. Very confusing. No. So there's no STL. Does anybody have a link to the, the bunny somewhere? <laughs> uh, that is not PLY. Okay. The model, the bunny, the bunny, PLY, IV, no. I want an STL, for example, or an OBJ. High resolution stand for bunny. From here. How high res is this? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, flat foot, uh, super high res. I don't want super high res. Uh, check in. This course, McNeil, there is. Can you share a link with that to that? Example STL files you can use for testing. The stand for bunny. Download the bunny from STL. Okay, let's, this looks promising. Let's see about this one. So we may have to do a piece about taking PLY data and, uh, and parsing it. We may have to. Uh, stand for bunny sample. Okay, so let's see. Let's open that file. Uh, yeah, I don't need to. Oh, no. No. This one has 300,000 vertices. No, this is not the original one. I don't want this is too much. Because we're going to have it's just the resolution is so much that it's going to be impossible to make a good case about. So also not good. All right. What about OBJ? Do we have OBJ stand for computer graphics meshes bunny? Oh, okay. So this looks promising. So stream here. So oh, so if this ever happens to you, Look at what just happened. So I had a link to an OBJ file. And when I landed on that OBJ, it turned out to be text file. This is very common because an OBJ file is actually a text file, with which, which is just a list of vertices with their coordinates. And it's still, and it also at some point it has a list of faces. You see F um, is the list of which face so every face is linking is a triangle that has three vertices. So this number indicates which one of these vertices on the list is um, is the vertex that this triangle is joining together. If you want to learn more about this idea of a mesh as a representation of vertices with XYZ coordinates, and triangles as the three indices of these vertices, check my um, intro to computational design lectures. At, at Harvard, and I have like a full lecture on meshes and how these are represented like this. So if you ever run into a text file like this, just save it, just control S, save it as an OBJ, save it as an OBJ file. And you can just open that with any uh, computer graphics, uh, 3D model environment. So for example, I'm going to drop that OBJ file. If I find it, where is it now? Where did I did I put it in the wrong folder? Uh, oh, bunny OBJ. Okay. Nope. Uh, okay, whatever. Uh, much better. So this object, if we list this object, we can see that it has actually 2500. That's a really nice number. I like this number a lot. So um, and we can see that uh, the y vertex, the y orientation is like somewhere very off. Uh, so this is very common for OBJ files where up is y typically. So I'm just going to rotate this thing uh, around this axis and it's going to be 90 degrees. 
And then I'm going to scale this a little as well from zero. I'm going to scale it by a factor of five. I'm going to scale it again by a factor of three. Yeah, something that, yes. And then I'm going to take in this mesh here. I'm going to take it in. Now I'm going to internalize it. I'm going to internalize this data. I'm going to delete it. And then for this one, I don't need to generate random points on the bunny because the bunny has all the vertices. Uh, so this is actually what I want to extract. So um, from meshes, I'm going to take uh, deconstruct mesh. Where is, no, sorry, this is here. Analysis, deconstruct mesh. So we do this and then we have all the vertices here as points. So we have the vertices and up, oh, up. Oh, so I'm going to hide everything. We have the vertices and then are you ready for this? This is going to be very cool. Are you ready for this? Boom. And now we can see how the bunny, how we have like this sort of like propagation, sort of growth on top of the bunny, maybe 200, 2000 vertices was not enough, but how cool is this ear? Huh? <laughs> we can also see that at some point the algorithm like runs out of like very nearby points and it has to jump, you know? Um, so, I mean, this algorithm is not suitable for like a, an actual real propagation uh, algorithm, but, um, but it's nice. It's, it's starting to give like some kind of um, sensation of, 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 of volume and surface based just based on pure proximity, which I think is nice. So I think I have all the material that I want for this. So I'm going to, so this is, mm -hmm. so these are the points. Actually, let me, uh, okay. So if I want to do this, I will need to just turn this on and off. Um, yes. I would just need to turn this on and off um, for the video. I'm thinking about the video. Would it be too much trouble to reduce the mesh of the Stanford Bunny in Rhino? It's not. Uh, Rhino has really good um, mesh simplification algorithms. Also, there's Mesh Mixer, which does a really, really good job at that. I think Mesh Mixer is an Autodesk product, but I think it's free. Uh, and it's, it's not open source, but I think it's free. So you can use that to do like advanced mesh operations, even like g generating support material for 3D printing. You can do that with mesh, mesh mixer. It's really good. Um, but no, it wouldn't be a problem. I'm just lazy. <laughs> uh, so, oh, I think I'm noticing the caffeine now. It's starting to kick in. Um, of Excel file in Grasshopper. Oh, BVR is bringing up a really interesting point about the difference between GH files and GHX files. I may want to talk about that. Should I talk about that in a sec at some point? I may, I may do that for the, what is it for the, for the main Grasshopper introduction to parametric modeling series that I'm trying to do. Let me write that down here. Because I, uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to remember to do that. Okay. Uh, one piece on. Because that difference is actually very interesting to, um, to understand. And it also has like very interesting implications if you're using version control. If you're using something like Git, GitHub, uh, or SVN, for example, um, it makes a huge difference whether if you version GH files or GHX files. So I may want to talk about that at some point. I may want to do a full series on using Git as well. Um, but yeah, I have so many series that I want to make that <laughs> uh, let's, I don't know when that's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to group these things here. Um, 
I'm going to turn this on and off. Uh, um, okay. Maybe I can do like a small thing about GH and GHX files by the end of today. So if you remember me, maybe it's not for like a video, but just like a really quick introduction. If you remind me of that, I can probably, I can probably talk a little bit about that. So where were we? Yes. So we were uh, here. We were probably here from the previous video. So I think this is where I want to start um, and talk about what am I going to do? This is like a small segment by the end of the other video where I talk about how this algorithm could be interesting design wise, right? Because at the end of the day, it's all about design. This is what we're interested in. Um, so let me recap on that. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I haven't recorded in two weeks. I'm rusted. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't want to finish this video without actually indulging a little bit in the work that we've done and trying to find ways or situations with uh, where these algorithms are not just for simply sorting points out, but there can be some interesting design applications that we can find for sorting these kind of points, right? So I think the, the way we've done things so far by working on a point cloud that is volumetric, so all the points are randomly placed inside of a volume, in this case, the one by one or two by two, cube here. Um, I think this is very interesting, but the result, for example, for the proximity sorting algorithm gives us this like entanglement of like this polyline that keeps getting tangled on top of itself. So it's very hard to see patterns or to see things arising from this volume, from this three dimensional volume. So I think interesting applications, for example, for this, um, for the proximity sorting algorithm could be when instead of applying those to points that lay randomly inside of a full volume, we apply those points, we apply this algorithm to points that lay randomly on something that is closer to a surface. So for example, I created here offline, um, I created here uh, three geometry situations that I think could be interesting, I'm going to turn off the random points. And what you can see here is that I created this one cylinder, like a simple surface, just without the the top and the, and, the, and the bottom, and I just distribute it randomly on top of this surface, like something like a thousand points. So if I turn off the surface, you can see that the points still, there are so many that they give us the impression of like a surface um, distribution of these points. This is very interesting because if I use these points now to, um, to generate the proximity, the proximity point, we can see that the result of this geometry is this kind of distribution of the polyline over um, this surface object because all the points are distributed over the surface. But it also gives us the impression of this sort of um, coral growth pattern on top of the surface that I find very interesting. Uh, a few things to note here. For example, we can see that if we go on top, we see that there are some parts of the polyline that are outliers. This is just because when the algorithm is like sweeping over all the points, at some point it runs out of points that are very nearby and it has to jump to the next one, which might be very far away. So it runs out of like local points in its neighborhood that are very close to each other and it has to jump out. This is actually much more prevalent, especially when it, we reach the end of the polyline. So for example, you can see that this end here is loose. And you can see that if you trace it back, you can see that it comes from these three points. But there's a long jump here, another long jump here, jump, jump, jump. And there's like another very long jump here, which is preceded by this other long jump, which makes sense. Because by the end of the algorithm, when we only have like a handful of points left, those points may just be remainders of whatever they were on the surface. Um, so it just it makes sense that this behaves this way. If this is something that we didn't want and we just wanted this kind of like growth um, effect pattern, something that we could do is we could increase or we could implement the algorithm to make 
some kind of rule where we say if the distance to the next point is over a particular threshold and that threshold could be controlled by a parameter on the component, then just stop the, the polyline that we had and start creating a new polyline. So that we, instead of ending with one polyline that goes over all the points, we end up with a bunch of polylines that capture the neighboring, like all the points that are in a certain proximity. Uh, this is actually quite easy to implement, um, but I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you, the viewer. So if you actually do that and it come, you come up with something cool, feel free to uh, post it here on the comments of this video or in our Discord channel or however you see fit, okay? Uh, but not only proximity, for example, if we do the C height, we can see that this cylinder is now very clearly sort of like sliced in uh, vertical layers. If we change this to the X property, for example, um, we can see how like also the, we have this sort of like uh, vertical slicing of the, um, of, the, um, of the cylinder, which I find very interesting. Uh, very similarly, I, uh, instead of a cylinder, which is a little boring, I created also this kind of napkin surface. It's just basically a loft between two curves on top of which I also distributed this um, 1000 random points. If now I use these for the distribution, we can see also a nice pattern that is arising out of, oops, sorry. We can see how this polyline is sort of tracing the curvature of the surface. Yet we also get, like we said before, we also get these big jumps between points. So you can see, for example, here, it looks like this is the end of the polyline and we can see like all the big jumps that it had to do before ending, right? Whereas where we start, which looks like it's here, it's like very smoothly, it's just like a lot of continuous points all across because it has a lot of points to choose from. Um, we can, for this one, we can also do C height and then we're basically, it looks almost like a the topography representation of this surface. But if we do X, X is very cool because it actually gives us this kind of like hairy <laughs> sort of uh, uh, representation of the surface, which I find interesting as well. Um, and last but not least, I also brought in here the Stanford Bunny. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is a very common model that is very popular for doing mesh processing operations. It's, a, it's an open source model. You can download it from a repository online. And, but it's very commonly used for mesh operations. So whenever um, you find on papers, you find a, a, uh, somebody describing an algorithm that performs some kind of operation on a mesh, on a geometric mesh, they very often use the Stanford Bunny as uh, the standard model that everybody checks meshes operations against. I don't know why it got popular for mesh operations, just like the Utah teapot got very popular for uh, 3D rendering operations. But anyway, what's interesting about the bunny is that because it's a mesh, at the end of the day, it's also internally, it has all these vertices, which if we isolate without the triangles, they also form a point cloud. And this point cloud is the point cloud that you would get by 3D scanning an object, for example. Um, but it's also, you can see that if you rotate, you can perceive how those vertices are sort of arranged on top of a surface that is not regular, like a B, like a nerve surface anymore. It's the surface of an object. Um, but it gives us this impression of this volumetric impression, which again, if we plug into our proximity sorting algorithm, we can see that now the polyline is describing this sort of volume of the bunny. And it's almost like it's, again, it's like this growth pattern that is growing on top of the surface with these jumps that are also happening due to the algorithm running out of proximal points, right? Um, similarly, X, uh, the X distribution, this looks almost like we're 3D printing, like, wait, wait, let, let's do that with, let's see. It looks almost like a really bad 3D print, right? Like a 3D print that went wrong. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it's very interesting. So I think that visually all the possibilities that these algorithms give us are very interesting. And that's why I think they are worthy of um, talking about them and spending some time and exploring the creative um, 
challenges and the creative opportunities that they give us. Okay, and, and that was it. Um, so this video I will want to use and cut this clip and put it on the previous video that we did two weeks ago and hopefully publish it this week. Um, hey, Leonardo, I was just talking about you before. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, yes, this can be called, so you can also write an algorithm where as you start, as you start finding, like, as you start joining points, you start looking at the distances between those points and calculating some kind of mean or some kind of average. And then whenever the distance jumps off really far away from that average, then that the, that's the cutting threshold. Um, and that's actually a very smart way of doing it. Um, if you're up for the challenge, maybe, maybe that's something you want to try uh, and share with the community, or maybe that's something that you want to do in your own channel. That would be really cool too, actually. Okay, so this is going to be it um, for the plug-in to the previous video. And now I'm going to take a two-minute bathroom break and we're going to come back and we're going to do the two geometry gems that we said we were going to do. One is going to be find, uh, find a point on our, along a relative distance along a line. And then we're going to use that to implement Chaikin's algorithm for um, for creating a smooth curve out of a polyline of control points. So um, yeah, two minute bathroom break, go drink some water, go to the bathroom, we'll be back in two minutes. Okay, are we back? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, this is telling me that there's a problem with audio. Yeah. Okay, so what are we doing now? We're doing point along a line. Let me save this stuff. I'm going to save this file, save this file. We don't want to bunny, tough for bunny. Um, and uh, let me prepare. So what are we going to do? We were going to do a point along a line. Is there any diagram that is nice and we can use here? Uh, this one, but this is a little too much. I may just do it myself. 
as usual. Okay, so let's get let's get to the drawing board. <laughs> uh, drawing board. Yes. 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 Um, okay, so that's going to be a sketch book. <clears throat> And that needs to go here and um, right here and let's draw oh, where are you no this is not what here okay and um, mm -hmm. so what are we going to do I'm going to explain, I'm going to draw two diagrams. I want to, okay, I want to do a diagram where I just explain relative distances and I want to do another diagram where I explain uh, the vector approach to this problem. So that's going to be, we have, um, we have one line and we have, yep, we have another, line which is almost identical okay great so now let's um let's create here let's create two points oops no we're going to we're going back to drawing so we're going to create a two point up oh, nope two points here two points here and then what i want to explain is that um if we now say this is the x and this is y and if we want a point that is somewhere um, that is somewhere here for example what we need to do is Wait, wait, no, no. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to say, we need to find this distance here and we need to find this distance here. And that's going to be, so this is going to be A, this is going to be B. Um, and then let's say that this is going to be this is going to be C here, um, and then this is going to be X, uh, and now this is going to be the difference in X, the difference in Y, um, <clears throat> so, and And I probably want here, I probably want to say this point is somewhere, yes, I probably want to say this point is somewhere, which is like a fraction of A and B. So for example, it's a fraction, I want to say F, no, I want to say N. No. N. No. What is a good letter for a fraction? So somebody, something that goes from zero to one. Um, let me say, for example, let's say this is going to be something that uh, is, for example, N times the length of A and B. This is a terrible little diagram, as usual. <laughs> well, there's not, there's not much we can do about that anymore. So if we do that, then we have that, we have this, and then, so we can say this is going to be n times the x, and this is going to be n times the y. 
And maybe these two things should be blue then, according to the diagram. Oh God, okay. So, so now here, what I say is, okay, so then I wanna calculate this distance and I want to calculate this distance here when each one of those is going to be so and so and so. So now, how does this sound for next? So I have a line, a line is two points, and I want to find a point that is somewhere in the middle, and that point is at a relative length along this. So what that means is that I need to find, uh, oh, this is in the wrong, this is in the wrong layer. Oops, nope. So let me take this and this, and I'm going to cut it, and I'm going to paste it in a new layer. Uh, so that's going to be, which is going to be here. And this one is going to be here. So now we're here, we're going to turn this on and then it's a phone. Okay. So that's one way of looking at the problem. Okay. The other way of looking at the problem is the following. We have a line here. The line, the line has, the line has, what are you laughing at, Tarika? <laughs> I'm, I'm making, I'm trying, you know, I'm working here. All right, give me a break. <laughs> Okay, so we have the, um, the line, um, which is, and the two points here also, which are A and B. So this is pretty much equal to, um, to saying that I have a, and I'm going to draw now a, I'm going to draw a vector. And I'm going to call that vector, um, for example, oops, nope. I'm going to call this vector, what am I going to call this vector? A, B. Uh, I'm going to do it here, A and B. Mm -hmm. I should have called it T. T is a better letter for a parameter. Ah, too late. So if I now want to find a point C along here, what I have to do is I have to make a vector from a, oops, let me do this right. Uh, I want to make a vector from A to C. And I have to say <clears throat> that the vector AC is equal to, <clears throat> up, stop, stop, stop. Let me save this <laughs> before I, I kill all the work. Equals N, like a scalar, times the vector A and B. <clears throat> This makes sense, right? Well, I mean, I haven't explained it yet, but graphically, it does make sense, right? Uh, so we would explain that by saying, okay, we have the line, we have two points, and those two points actually define a vector, which is, which could be found by simply calculating which doing vector algebra could be found by doing B, sorry, by doing bleh, B minus A. And I'm going to paste this, put, put it all the way down here. 
And then if we want to find, find a point z, and we just have to find that vector, and it turns out that that vector is equal to vector a, b times that factor, because it's a scalar multiplication. And that gives us all these diagrams here. Choo-hoo! Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, sorry. OK, I'm going to save this. I'm going to open. OK. OK, so this looks good to me. I think I can start explaining. Um, um, yeah, BBR is asking for the mesh. Can anybody go to, can somebody go to the, um, my GSD introduction to computational design playlist and share the playlist or share the video that where I talk about meshes? Uh, maybe somebody in the chat can do that. Um, otherwise, I'll do it by the end of the, uh, 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 of the lecture. So I'll do that. Okay, so then let me turn everything off and then I can explain. Can you hear my neighbor singing? <laughs> Somebody's singing very loud on the street. OK, and maybe I can just uh, explain this here, right? Because um, since, yeah, I can explain it here because like I'm not going to be drawing anything else. Am I going to be drawing anything? I don't think so. So, okay. Can you can you hear my neighbor? <laughs> She's really loud. <laughs> okay, and I have my windows open. It's very hot here, um, and I don't want the AC. Cool. So, so let's start. <clears throat> You hear my neighbor? Oh my God, seriously. <sighs> I know, Tarika, it's fine. I'm just, I'm just joking. Uh, <clears throat> uh, all right, so let's close the window. Okay. So if you see me start sweating and passing out, um, just call someone <laughs> and tell them that there's been an accident. <laughs> That somebody somebody died while doing vector algebra. Anyway, so um, where were we? Okay, so we're going to explain this. Yes. Um, now, um, okay. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. So um, I'm going to explain first uh, how the algorithm works. Um, and uh, it's going to be super simple because it's also a, one of the most foundational um, geometry algorithms that you can think of. And I'm going to explain it in two ways. I'm going to explain it like geometrically or numerically. I don't know what that one is. But I'm also going to explain it um, from a vector algebra interpretation. So whichever one resonates with you better, um, that's, that's probably the interpretation that you want from this algorithm. So remember, what we're calculating is uh, a point at a relative distance along a line. But as usual, um, a line is, is not a line. What a line is, in fact, is just that a line is defined by the two points at the ends of that line segment, okay? We're always going to work with line segments. Lines, by definition, are actually infinite. So a line segment is a much more appropriate way of talking about uh, something that has a start and an end, linearly. So for us, what's important is the two points. And what we want is to find a point somewhere in the middle of those two points at a distance along that line that is relative to a factor. We're going to call that factor n. And um, it's going to be relative because when this factor is zero, C is going to be basically at the starting point of the line. When that factor is one, that the point C is going to be at the end of the line, so it's going to be B. And when it has any other value between zero and one, it's going to be 
in the range between these two points. No matter how long this line is actually in Euclidean terms, what we want is the relative distance along this one. So if we know that, we will know that if n is 0 0.5, then c will be in the actual middle, in the actual center of this line. But how do we calculate that? Well, it's actually quite easy, because if we know that this line in space, uh, and I'm talking 2D here, but everything applies to 3D as well. If we know that this line, uh, the, the distance between the two points has an X component. So we, we can find from the coordinates of B and A, we can find how, my, how far apart in the X direction they are and how far apart in the Y direction they are. Then it follows geometrically that how far away z, c, is going to be from the first point in the x direction and in the y direction is also exactly proportional to how far away it is along the actual line. So if this is 0 0.5, this point is going to be along x is going to be 0 0.5 times the distance in the x direction between a and b. And if this point is 0 0.5 on the y direction is also going to be 0 0.5 times the difference in the y direction between these two points. So the algorithm will be as simple as computing the distance between the two points in x, y, and z, and then multiplying those distances by the factor, the relative factor that we are, um, that we are inputting, and then with those values adding, creating this point by taking the initial Point and adding those values x, y, and c to that point. So that's the geometry or numerical interpretation of the algorithm. If you are more of a vector algebra person, you can look at this problem from a different perspective. You can look at this problem as saying we have the line, we have the two endpoints, and we know that these two points form a vector between them. This vector, if we call this vector a, b, then we know that the, this vector is defined by subtracting from the coordinates of B, subtracting the coordinates of A. This is how we can calculate this vector. And we know that if we want to find a point along this vector that is at a particular relative distance, what we can do is we can try to find which one is the vector AC that we need to add to A in order to get C. And it also follows from this very same relationship that um, the length or the, the, um, or the, um, the coordinates of vector AC, which is this one, it follows that it is a simple scalar multiplication of vector AB, which is the longest one, times that relative factor from 0 to 1 or 0.5 or whatever you want. So the vector AC equals this factor times vector AB. So whichever um, is easier to understand or whichever way of looking at this problem resonates more with you, um, that's the one that I would like you to stick with. I'm going to implement both systems. One, this I'm going to implement the one on the left because this one is agnostic to whichever uh, geometry library you're using. You don't need vector objects or point objects or anything. And this one is a little easier and faster to do if you are working on an environment that already has points, vectors, or this kind of geometry objects as classes and structs. Like for example, it's the case of Grasshopper, Rhino Common, Unity, or any other um, geometry savvy uh, environment. So I think we're ready. I think let's, 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 get, let's get some code cracking. All right, okay, so this was good, I think. So we're gonna stick to, to that. And, um, and now let's fire some rhino, grasshopper, and get, um, and get going. How's everybody doing? Yoo-hoo! The architecture machine, the role of computer, what is this? The architecture machine, the role of computers in architecture. Oh, a new book. Oh, interesting. 
Okay. Is this a book or a, a video? Or what is it? The book. It's a book. Okay. Let's go. Let's do this now. <clears throat> okay, so now let me just draw a line in 3D space. Um, and I'm going to take this and I'm going to... I don't think I can use a line. Uh, yeah, I can. I know. Uh, yep, set one line. Okay, so I'm going to set it here because it has to be internalized. Whatever. Um, do I want that? No, I think I want the geometry object so that I can move things around. So polyline. Do I want that? What do I want? What do I want? I want... When I finish this, I will probably want to move things around to prove that it's relative. So I do actually want some kind of geometry object that I can pull from. Or maybe I just want the points. Maybe I just want the points. Maybe that's what I want. Yep. Let's do points. So that reinforces that idea of a line is not a line, a line is just two points. Okay, so let's do that, yes. Um, so, point, starting point here, um, end point here, and I'm just going to draw a line just for the sake of visual flavor, but we don't really care about that. What we care is about this point, uh, which I'm going to call A, I'm going to call B, and then I'm going to call this, I said N, but I'm actually, it should be called T. Um, what do I want to do about that? Do I want to confuse people against the diagram? Let's just stick to the diagram uh, for the sake of consistency. Uh, so I want to move this. Oh, and ah, you guys have to remind me um, by focals. Um, it's important. <laughs> uh, did somebody share the lecture to the meshes? Okay, uh, here, here, and we're going to um, have like a slider here, a number slider that's going to go from zero to one. And I will want to actually be, remind me of this. I will want to change the range of this as well so that um, so that we can prove that this actually works for extending the point beyond the boundaries of, of the line, okay? And this is going to be C. All right. Where did you share it, Arasto? I didn't see it on the, on the chat. Can you send private messages on this chat? Um, Okay, and I'm going to turn off the widgets just because it's just not giving us anything. Okay, and I think this is where we want to start. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, but if you can still share it uh, for the rest of the um, for the rest of the people. Okay, now let's, um, let's get to this. And I'm going to save this somewhere. Uh, oops, uh, no, this one. Grasshopper, binary, be, 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 uh, point along line. Mm, okay. Okay. So, uh, you can't post links on the chat? So you have not been seeing my Discord channel links? That's weird. 
All right. So, so if I post this, can you see this link? Huh? Okay. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you figure that out. <laughs> let me focus. I think only your links are visible. You can see the Discord link. Ah, okay. Because you have um. The Discord link. Okay. Maybe we should start a channel on Discord where we do. No, Arasto, I cannot see your link. No. I cannot see anybody's links. Only I can do that. Okay. Uh, oh, that sucks. Ah, uh, stupid YouTube. <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna shut down my account now <laughs> mm. yeah maybe we want to have um, a, 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 a channel on on discord that is about like live conversation while this is happening uh, I just cannot I just cannot look at more windows it will be a little confusing to me but um, I think that could work you know what let me just create it and see how it works I'm going to create the channel and it's going to call, it's going to be called life. All right. I just did it. Um, ooh, and, um, let me just do that. So, oh, and I want to add some emoji here. So what, it, what is a good emoji for life? Uh, a camera, uh, a camera, sure. Um, yeah, movie camera. I like this one. So let's copy this. Let's paste it here. Yes. Uh, for live chatting while live streaming. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the camera. It's so weird. The cameras are different. All right. Can you read me? Boom. Okay. I'm going to leave that there. You guys, uh, can you see it in quotes? I cannot see it in quotes. No, I cannot see. No, I guess, um, I guess I only I can post uh, links. That kind of sucks. Uh, Arasto is on the on the chat already. <laughs> yep. All right. Cool. Okay. It's all, it's eleven thirty already, guys. Um, we're not <laughs> we're not gonna get anywhere close to what I want it to be. Uh, okay. Let's let's get this done. It's gonna be super fast. Okay. Um, and let's put this at zero point five, for example. Um. So now, in <clears throat> I'm going to implement this algorithm using C# -sharp in um, as a, in a C# -sharp script here in Grasshopper. So remember, what I have here right now is two points that are in Rhino. I brought these two points as parameter boxes into Grasshopper, and then just for the sake of visual flavor, I'm using a line component to just trace this visual line between them. Um, but this line component is actually useless for us because what we care is about understanding a line just as two points. Anything other is just visual flavor. So for our component, what we want is um, we want the two points and as inputs. So I'm going to create a C sharp script component and then I'm going to right click on each one of the inputs and say this object has to be of the type point 3D. This other one has to be of the type point 3D and the value for the normalized value, the parameter along that line is going to be N which I'm also going to right click and force this to be a double. So a number with decimal precision. And then the output is going to be the point C. When I double click here, now we can open our C sharp scripting window. And you can see that we have the main function, which is taking in two points A and B, uh, the parameter and is returning as a reference, the C point object. If you don't have, if you have an environment where you don't have a point object, you can just replace this by 
x0, y0, z0, and then um, x1, b1, sorry, y1, c1, whatever. Um, or you can just create like a small point class, which is super easy to do. Also, I'm going to write this code here as, um, as a function in itself, because I will want to use this function and copy paste it between different other components that I may write at some point. Uh, because I'm actually recording this geometry gem because I want to make another geometry gem uh, where I'm going to be using this, this functionality. So very easy. I'm going to here, the output of this component is going to be C is going to be equal to uh, a function that I'm going to call point along line, for example, this is going to be the name of the function. And first point is going to be a B is going to be the second point and n is going to be the factor along that. And now I have to actually create that function. So I'm going to create a function that is going to be called point along line, and it's going to take a point 3d object, I'm going to call it lowercase a, a another point 3d object, uh, like lowercase b, and a number that I'm going to call the parameter, which is going to be t. And remember, this function will calculate this point and return another point object, which is along this line. So I need to make sure that I that I return an object of the type point 3d. Again, if you are working on an environment that doesn't have point or vector objects, just um, create yourself like a really quick point class that has like x, y, z properties, and it will be super easy to, um, to just mimic this functionality. Uh, and then once we're here, if we remember, um, we're going to implement it both ways, we're going to implement it the numerical way first, which is this part here on the left, and then we're going to do the exact same thing uh, with vector algebra, which is only available if your platform your environment has uh, vector algebra. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, remember from the diagram, the first thing that we need to do is we need to calculate the x, y and z differences between a and b. And then once we have that, we can multiply them by the factor, so the parameter, and then we can recreate c by adding to the coordinates of a, adding the coordinates of uh, that factor difference. So I'm going to do that very verbosely here. So I'm going to say the coordinate difference between a and b in the x direction is going to be b dot x minus a dot x. So the coordinates, the x coordinates of b minus the x coordinate of a, I'm going to do uh, double dy is going to be equal to b dot x minus a dot, sorry, y minus a dot y, and then double dc is going to be equal to b dot c minus a dot c. Wonderful. So, um, so now that we have this, um, what we need to do is we need to calculate for C, how far along those differences it is. So what I'm going to say is, for example, I'm going to say, uh, NX. So this distance, how far away in the X direction Z is away from X, I'm going to call that NX. And that's going to be equal to t times dx. So if dx was three units, and t is 0.5. So it's going to be half of that. Uh, and I'm going to do that the same and y is going to be t dot dy. Oh, oh, I'm having, I'm having keyboard problems these days. Um, yep, I'm having a lot of this. Um, is my keyboard working? Yes, so t and double n c is going to be equal to t dot d c. And now, now that we have this, we can say, let me now calculate the actual coordinates of point c in Euclidean space. So in the world coordinates, and those coordinates are going to be equal to the coordinates of point a plus this difference plus this difference plus the other difference in C that we just calculated. So I'm going to also be very verbose about that. So I'm going to say 
double double c x is going to be equal to a dot x plus n x. Uh, double c y is going to be equal to a dot y plus n y. And then double um, c c equals a dot c plus n c. So these are the coordinates of uh, point C in world coordinates. So now it's just as easy as saying the point, the, sorry, actually point 3D C is going to be equal to uh, a new point 3D object that is going to be have coordinates CX, CY, and CC. And I just, this function is just going to return that point. Obviously, all this code is a little long and I could have used some shortcuts. So I could just, instead of doing this, I could just like have done that inline here, or I could just have compressed everything as in inline. But for the sake of clarity, as because this is an educational video, I just wanted to be very clear about the process. Okay. And then now that we have this, let's see if this runs. Oh, interesting. It, do it does run. <laughs> so, uh, let's see if if I now go here and I say, well, let's see if when it goes to zero, we're all the way at the beginning. Yes, we are. And when we go to one, we're all the way at the end and anywhere we're just in the middle. And then if I move these points, so if I now move the point, we can see that that the coordinates of that point are adjusting accordingly. Um, so that's pretty much it. That is just as easy as it was. Um, okay, and now what I want to do is, um, I want to explain the same way, but uh, <clears throat> doing it uh, with vector algebra, which, yeah. Um, vector algebra. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, what I would also like to do now is I would like to do the same operation, but instead of doing it with such a numerical approach, which is good because this will work on pretty much any platform or environment that you can work on. If you have a system that has point and vector objects, you probably have access to vector algebra, uh, which will give you like a more synthetic and faster way of doing this. So um, a similar approach to that would have been um, sorry. Um, <laughs> Somebody shared the other day, how do you comment out like a lot of code? Was it control K L? No, control K D, control K K. Uh, that was coming from Visual Studio, right? Somebody on the chat mentioned the other day how to do this and I totally forgot. Uh, Visual Studio shortcuts uh, comment. What am I writing that? Oh, I'm not writing it anywhere. Visual Studio shortcuts comments keyboard control K C control K U control K C yeah that was Arasto you're right that was you control K C ah yes oh that's awesome oh oh but I, how do you undo it ah oh, control K U oh okay all right okay so let me start again let me start the video again and to a comment control K U all right, thank you. Um, where was I? Yes. Now, something that I also want to do is I want to do the exact same operation, but with vector algebra, in case you're working in a framework that has uh, geometry objects and you have access to vector algebra, like it is the case here, or for example, with Unity or other such geometry savvy environments. So what we can do is like all this code, instead of 
um, doing it numerically, which is something that will work everywhere because it's just numbers that we were using. Uh, what we can do is we can follow the vector approach in which what we just need to do is we need to find the vector between point A and B. So that's going to be vector AB. Then we're going to do uh, a scalar operation with that vector where we're going to reduce it by the factor that we're looking at. And then we're going to compute C by adding to the coordinates of A, adding the vector C. So it's going to be super easy. So we just need to do... We just need to say, um, I want a vector 3D object that is what we're going to call AB. And that's going to be the coordinates of point B minus the coordinates of point A. And this is something that I can do because here in RhinoScript, we can do uh, vector operations with points and with vectors. Now, after that, what I can say is I can calculate vector 3D, I can calculate vector AC by saying this has to be equal to vector AB times that factor. So it's a scalar operation of a vector. So T times the vector AB. And then once we have that, um, calculating C, point 3D C is just as equal as simple as taking point A and adding vector AC to it. And then if we do that, and I run this code, um, nothing changes because everything is working just the same. Uh, and we have this, we have this, we can move the point, etc, etc. Um, which one of these two approaches is better? Um, I'm not sure. I think maybe this one has a little bit more overhead because it has to call functions back and forth. Um, although this other one is actually, it's creating a lot of, um, it's creating a lot of, uh, uh, what is it called? It's creating a lot of variables in the way. I'm not sure, but they're both very similar. Whichever resonates with you, um, that's probably the one that you should use or whichever uh, is available to you depending on the system that you're using. I have point and vector 3D objects here and I have access to vector algebra in this form. But if you don't, then you probably have to go through this route. Okay. Um, okay. And the last thing I want to show is like some interesting property of this. And it is the interesting property of this system is that we have talked about how zero means being at the beginning of the point, one being at the end of a point, and then anything between being relative distances. But if I actually open up this, the range of this slider and I let it move over a larger range, so for example, minus one and two, we can also see that if I go over one, this is still working because the relative distance doesn't have to be constrained to just the segment the distance where the point is, even if it's negative, or even if it's over one, is still going to be proportional to the length of the object. So we can see that if we go all the way to one, the distance between the point and B is two times the distance between the point and A. And similarly, if we go to minus one, so we also see that this is just an extension and that this distance is the same as this one. So um, this algorithm can also help you extend a point beyond the boundaries of um, the line segment. Okay, so this is a very, very foundational algorithm. This function is something that you can probably use for your geometry, computational geometry, toolkit, whatever, uh, because you will perform this operation so, so, so often. And actually, we are building this geometry gem because in the next geometry gem, where I'm going to do a, uh, an algorithm for generating smooth curves out of a polyline of control points, I'm going to be using this operation very, very often. Okay, so thank you for being here and um, hope to see you in another video. And if you liked what you saw, please subscribe, hit I like, uh, turn on notifications and all that stuff. You know how it works. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, Arasto, can we make it an overload? An overload is something that is typically used 
when um, you have different kinds of inputs, not just that internally it works differently. And also, um, I don't see why you would want to do two overloads and then choose which one to work with, because at the end of the day, what you want is to make a decision about which one of them both uh, to use. You don't care about how that works internally. So just make a decision about where, for the system that you're using, which one does the job better, either faster or, um, or cleaner for you. Um, and um, so, yeah. And so just create a, a multiplication by a factor between zero and one in the case of the vectors, of course. I'm not sure if I understand that question, but yes. So here, um, just create, um, just multiply the vector by that factor. And that's how you take, that's the factor that you add here. I'm going to put some comments here. Find relative distances between points. Uh, compute relative distances for C. Compute world coordinates for C. Compute C point. And this is going to be doing it the vector algebra way. Okay. All right. So, um, and this function, um, what does this function do? This function uh, returns a point at a relative distance t between a, between points a and b. All right. That sounds about right. Okay. Good stuff. Um, okay, so are we ready for the other video? <laughs> that was the one that I wanted to do in the first place, and it took me two hours to get here. Um, I actually don't know what to do about this because it may take at least another hour to make this video. I don't know if to just put a pause on this one, do it next week, do it this afternoon. I have a lot of stuff I don't think I can do this afternoon. Um, that's unfortunate. What should we do? What do you think we should do? Hmm? Want to do it now? Want to do it next, next week? Ah, <sighs> um... Yeah, I don't want to rush things. Um, it's Friday. Oh, come on. <laughs> what does that mean? Does it, does it mean come on as in like, shut up and do it? Or does it mean as in like, go have fun and enjoy the weekend? <laughs> oh, I see. I see. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for giving me a break. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, I think Ahmad has a good point. Let's do some Q&A now. Yeah, and because I don't want to rush. I don't want to be doing this fast or badly or poorly just because I don't have the time to do it now. So we can do it next time. Um, so yeah, so let's let's push it to the next time. So next week or next, actually, I don't, whenever, whenever this happens, I'm not, I think I might be taking next weekend off uh, as well. So whenever this happens, um, we'll just take our time and do it nicely and smooth, you know. Um, so yeah, um, next next time we'll do it next time. So let me save this, um, and let's let's do some Q let's do some Q and A. So if you want um, if you want to put some questions there or some thoughts while I shut things down here. Um, oh wait, I would like to internalize these points. Probably yep, internalize points. Internalize data. All right, great. And this goes here. Okay, and I don't want to save any of these. And this is saved already. And I can shut this down. Okay. So. Uh, 
All right, so I think we have quorum. We're doing this next week. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, but if you are interested, check it out. Maybe, okay, so how about this? How about if, let me, let me Google this again for you. Some of you are already starting to get a bit more familiar with C Sharp and Grasshopper. Uh, so, Chaikin's algorithm. So how about, I saw this on written in processing. Okay, so I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to post a couple links here. I'm going to post the link to the, um, I'm going to post a link to this observable, the one that I showed on the, I'm also going to show a link to like a simple paper that explains a little bit of like, it doesn't have any code, but it explains like an overview of how the algorithm works. So maybe some of you want to give it a try and want to try implementing the, the algorithm in a C-sharp component. And maybe you can share that with us on the comments here. Maybe you can um, share that on the Discord. Maybe we can have a conversation about that. In the, maybe it can be, when, maybe we can, oh, interesting. Maybe when we do a geometry jam or a challenge, maybe I can let you know in advance, you can give it a try. And then when you come and we show the video, you're like, oh, so that's how he solved that problem. Or that's how he was looking at this issue. That could be like a really good thing. Uh, from an educational perspective for you, actually. So I'm going to open this challenge. Who wants to try to write a C-sharp component to do the Chaikin's algorithm? All right. <laughs> if you want to give it a try, make sure to, we're going to, okay, so I'm going to, we're going to have that as a conversation going on bonfire on the Discord or on the live channel. Let's do bonfire. No, let's keep bonfire for regional conversation. Let's do, um, uh, let's do, um, let's do in the in the live channel. Okay, so we're going to do that channel. We're going to do this challenge on the live channel. We're going to keep the conversation there, and then maybe next week when I shoot the video, when I record the video, I can I can I can also bring up like nice examples of what people did and what didn't, or like alternative approaches between how I did it and how other people did it. And maybe if your code is good and it works, we can also post it on GitHub as an alternative way of doing this. That could be really cool. Okay, so we got a deal. Challenge, who's accepting the challenge? Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, Chaikin's algorithm for, for next week or next time we meet or whatever, okay? And then I will record, um, I will record the video with my take. And remember for these things, there's no, there's no right or wrong. Um, there are as uh, algorithms usually have as many ways of tackling them or thinking about them as colors or, you know, you know how they say those things. I'm going to turn the AC on. Sorry. <laughs> I'm boiling here. Um, and, and also if you're, maybe you're not so versed in C sharp yet or in coding in general, maybe you can just try with vanilla grasshopper. You will have to use recursion though. So you will have to use some kind of like Anemone or Hoopsnake or whatever, the plugin uh, that does recursion these days. Um, but you can try that out, okay? So Vanilla Grasshopper also works uh, great because I'm actually not going to do it with that. So we could use that as a... Um... All right, so, ooh, ooh, I like this. <laughs> Okay, there's a couple questions. Uh, Jose, can you talk about if it is possible to use a Python library in C Sharp? I'm thinking of Compass by Block Research Group in ETH. Well, there is this thing called Iron Python, and it's a. I don't think the word compiler is fair. I think it's a transpiler. So, what it does is that it lets you write. Python code, which then gets compiled into C sharp code. Um, the problem with that is that I'm not sure. So, and I know that, for example, Iron Python is what Dynamo, which is um, which is Autodesk's version of Grasshopper, uh, it is what Dynamo uses for Python scripting within Dynamo and for its components. Um, 
usually what happens with that is that you have a lot of problems with like Python versions and uh, especially if you're using an, a third party library like Compass, the version that that library uses might be different from the from the version that Iron Python uses. So you have a lot of compatibility issues with that. It's usually a mess. Um, so my advice in general is that if you want to use Compass, just find a Python environment where you can use Compass and just use it and don't have to go back and forth between C Sharp or whatever, just because um, it's going to be a headache and a nightmare. And you're basically forcing things to work in places where they shouldn't be working anyway. So, um, but you could use, there are tools to make that happen, such as, for example, Iron Python. I'm not sure what the Python, <clears throat> what the Python component in Grasshopper uses under the hood, but I would, I would say that it probably uses some Iron Python sort of similar something something under the hood. Um, I don't think it, it does. There has to be some way of connecting that Python UI to uh, C Sharp or to the C kernel that is running, the C++ kernel that is running inside of Rhino Common. But I'm not sure about the details of that. So I can't really tell. Now, um, Arasto is saying, is asking if we create something interesting and want to have your thoughts on it or maybe share it with the community. Where do you prefer we post it? On Discord? On which section? Um, that's a good question. I prefer Discord just because I, I see it. Oh, somebody posted the, the library, the meshes. Um, somebody posted the video to the meshes. This is really cool. Uh, and this is the resources from the other day. Thank you, Monique. Uh, thank you, Arasto. What do I prefer? I think I have, right now we have the bonfire which is the general channel for Chitty Chatter. Um, I just created live for, oh, good question, VR. I just created live for parallel conversation here and for sharing links. Um, I may not be able to see this screen very much while we're doing live stream, just because I have the chat window there. And that already takes a lot of my attention. So like having the Discord, it's just too much. I don't have, I'm very much a monotask person. Um, but yes, so this can be, and, um, where do we share work? I think we did create this set of, I think we created these channels here for like related questions, etc. but I don't see why this could not just be, and the Python one is the most popular. Uh, <laughs> I don't see why this couldn't be where we share work. Actually, like Chino, Chino89 was sharing some work here. So maybe, maybe we could use these channels to share work. If it's Python, if it's Grasshopper, C Sharp, or whatever, just post it here and people can comment and stuff. Perhaps for the challenge, we can also put it here. I don't know. Whatever. Just try something out and whatever. I see this. I see the Discord like every here and then. Um, so let's try. Let's start with these channels here, and then we can we can take it from there. And maybe we create like a new like a new channel at the community level at some point where like uh, coding challenges or something like that. You know. Um, so let's. Uh, yeah, I think Discord is a good place to to start. Best Grasshopper plugin in my opinion. <laughs> I don't, well, Machina. <laughs> nah, I'm joking about that. Um, best Grasshopper plugin in my opinion. I don't, have a, I don't have a favorite. I have a lot that I like a lot. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of basically all of Andrew Human's plugins. I think he's really good and he is like very meta and he's like very, very skilled with the c -sharp framework. So he finds like the tiny corners where like you can like plug things and retrieve information. He's really good at doing that. So I'm a huge fan of all his, pretty much all his um, uh, libraries. And he's also a nice designer. So they also have like nice icons and they look good. They feel like a real plugin as opposed to the ones that I do where I don't 
I don't take care, good enough care about the icons and the visual aspects, etc. So, uh, whatever. I like Kangaroo a lot. That's kind of like the first one that I used. I'm a big fan of Daniel Piker's work. Um, um, in terms of robots, you know, I develop Machina, so I like that a lot as well. Um, but I'm also a big fan of Robots by Vicente Soler in the Bartlett. Um, really good plugin for robots as well. Uh, Pufferfish. I have to say I've never really used Pufferfish, but I see it's very popular. Um, and just because it, like, it lets you create like this very like uh, convoluted and complex geometry with like, very few components. So if that's your jam, um, I think it's a really good plugin. Very comprehensive as well. I met Mike Pryor, the author, very recently, and he, I, I had a lot of fun with him. So, I don't know. I, I have a bunch. I don't have a, a one particular favorite. I also like the ones that are open source because I believe in open source community and contribution. So um, that's usually a plus. And uh, I think people are happy with the challenge. <laughs> Let's see how that works out. Uh, Kartik wants to try with Python. You're more than welcome to try with Python. You're more than welcome to try with C Sharp, with Vanilla Grasshopper, whatever you are. At the end of the day, this is about what we can do not with what can we do that okay so i don't care about that any example that does the job um i'm very happy to to feature it and talk about it etc um oh gxx file really good point <clears throat> so let me let me do a quick example let's say we have rhino for example what is rhino <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's say we have a Rhino file where we have a point. <coughs> and we have a super simple grasshopper file. <clears throat> and we have a super simple grasshopper file which is just taking the point, bringing it in, putting a setting, putting a slider, not this one, putting a slider for a value and just like a sphere. For example, the sphere, this is the center, and this is the radius, right? Couldn't be any simpler. And I'm going to save this on my desktop, and I'm going to save it as sphere. And I'm going to save it as gh. I'm also now going to save the exact same file, but instead of gh, I'm going to choose not binary, but xml. So ghx. And I'm going to save the same file. And that's it. You know, you've seen this, right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find those two files, which are here. I'm going to right click on GH, and you can see that this file is 2.92 kilobytes. So very small. And the other one is probably like 10 times bigger. Yes, it's like 20.7 kilobytes. So you would be inclined to say, oh, um, I'd rather use GH than GHX just because it's light, more lightweight, and it's true. The difference between these two files formats is, well, the difference, the legacy difference is that this is how Grasshopper started with GHX files. And it was around version 6 or 7 that this new binary format kicked in uh, just to save space because it saves about like 10, it, gives, it, it has files that are about 10% size. Now, the difference is that there's no different. There's no difference between the content of the file. Both files are identical. The only difference is that this one file, if you open it with a text editor, so I'm going to open, for example, Visual Studio Code, okay? If you open this file with the GHX file with a with a Visual Studio, what you, can see, what you can see is that this file internally is actually a text file. And it's a text file that contains this weird uh, sort of thing that looks like code, but it's not really code. 
uh, it's actually what's called a markup language and it's called it's basically an XML file and you can Google this XML file is a very common format what this format does is that it basically creates a hierarchy of objects by using tags uh, that open and close certain sections of this certain sections of these objects so for example let me find where the sphere where the sphere component is so you can see here we have this thing called chunk which if I use a smart text editor I can compress I have this other chunk here chunk number one and I have chunk number uh, definition objects blob contains a collection of three dimensional points this one chunk number one all right uh, actually no this is this is number one this is number zero exactly so these three chunks here and all the code that they have internally are the chunks that represent each one of the three components that I had remember I had a point container I had a sphere component and a slider so if I expand this one zero you can see that inside it has contains a collection of three-dimensional points it has a lot of other information like a, a unique identifier x y width and height so that's the dimensions of the component on the screen uh, whether if it has some persistent data or not this is something that we don't need to get into component one is the, you see that it's the number slider and all the properties for that number slider so x y where this is on the canvas uh, where the point is right now which value it has and then number two is the sphere component creates a spherical surface where it is some other properties of for the parameters and some information about how they're linked together so this that you're seeing here is just a text representation of all the properties of all the objects that are inside of a grasshopper definition in a format that is called XML because it's a markup format which is basically encapsulating properties inside of tags that open so this tag is open in here and uh, tags that open and then they close with this forward slash so this is XML and this is internally how Grasshopper reads a file and it knows where to display the components of that file and where to link them with wires and which default values they have when you open the file. The difference between the GHX file and the GH file is simply that this file is the same thing but it's just compressed. It's a binary. So if I open it in a text editor, I will not be able to see text. I will just see this gibberish of like characters because the file has been compressed and therefore I cannot see the actual characters of the XML anymore. They are just zeros and ones that when I open on a text editor, they look like this gibberish. The only thing that I would need to do is I would need to decompress, unpack this file in order to retrieve the text representation of this and it just so happens that text is not very efficient when saved in memory so that's why when you compress a file so let me zip this file for example if I zip this file um, we can see that the file is now roughly 3.94 kilobytes so it looks like whichever algorithm the author is using to pack this file is a little more efficient than just like a simple zipping so that's it that's the difference between uh, GH and GXX. But long story short, uh, this is the pure raw text file that contains the properties of the grasshopper definition. And this is the same one, just um, as a zip file, just compressed into a binary. But they both contain the same information. One is readable as, as a human. Uh, whether if you agree that this can be read by a human or not, that's a different story. But at least you can read the text. The other one is zeros and ones that have been compressed with the same information. Was this clear? This happens, this representation, the textual one, happens to have a lot of advantages if you're doing version control. Because version control can look inside the text file and see how the file is changing as you are working on it and then create 
control points create like uh, checkpoints uh, along that file. But we're not going to get into that today. Um, I'll do at some point. I'll do a piece or like a series of tutorials on Git and version control and that kind of stuff. Was this clear? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. Um, Salvador is saying that it's a better setup with Anaconda. Compass has how to set up the environment. Yep. Uh, the GHX, etc. Uh, people are welcome. How about create a specific channel for work sharing named any other generic name? Uh, we could do that. We could share work. Um, okay, let's just do that. Um, I'll do that at some point. I'll create the. Um, um, I'll create that at some point. Uh, yes, Kartik, please go ahead and um, create the uh, coding challenge. Um, can we create that coding challenge channel in the code section? Kartik, by the way, was um, was the one who helped me start and create the the Discord channel, and he's the main manager of the server. Um, so, so yeah, please go ahead and, and do that. And um, maybe under community, can we create a channel also called like work sharing or like something like that so that people can work, can share their own stuff in there. And this is super important. We need emojis for everything. Okay. Um, I super emoji person. <laughs> so we need that. Uh, thank you, Kartik, for that. Uh, okay. Uh, Galiaf is asking about line simplification and cleaning. Yes, uh, that's on the works. That's actually on my to-do list. Uh, so, but we're still not there yet. We're very close. We started with points, and then whenever that's clear we will get two lines, okay? Which is also a very interesting exercise. Yes. Okay, and I think with that, I'm ready to start the weekend. <laughs> All right, I hope this was useful for everybody. Um, and um, yes, I'm still recording. Okay, so... I think that was, I hope that was useful for everybody. And um, I'll see you guys next week or the other one or whenever um, our next session is. I think, well, I'll combine and create some new plugin for Grasshopper. It's a good idea. Ooh, BVR. How about a plugin that is just all the geometry gems that we've done so far? How cool would that be? Huh? I don't. I really don't have time to do that. But if somebody wants to take that up and do it, I'm more than happy to support that. Uh, we could even make it like a public project on the Parametric Camp repo. That would be really cool. Um, okay. All right. Everybody have a good weekend. Um, thank you for being here. Um, uh, we will crunch the videos and post them online as soon as possible. And see you next time. <laughs>